Welcome to the City of Chicago, City Club of Chicago program today featuring the county assessor. Let me remove my mask a little bit so you can see better. Fritz Kagey. I'm Dr. Ed Mazur, chairman of the City Club of Chicago. We're delighted that you could join with us today for one of our Zoom sessions. One of these days, we promise that hopefully when we conquer the pandemic, we will go back to having in-person general meetings that so many of us uh, would like to return to as quickly as possible. In its interim, of course, then we have these Zoom meetings. And with us today is our favorite assessor, the Cook County Assessor, Fritz Kagey. Assessor Kagey has spent more than 20 years valuing assets as a mutual fund portfolio manager and analyst. In 13 years at the Columbia Wanger Asset Management, he served as a financial steward, helping average families save for retirement, focusing on small companies operating around the world. Fritz Kagey holds the Chartered Financial Analyst and Certified Illinois Assessment Officer designations. He's a member of the IAAO, the International Association of Assessing Officers. Fritz Kagi first took office in 2018. During his tenure, he has been widely recognized as bringing fairness, ethics, and transparency to the Cook County Assessor's Office with a vision focused on operational changes, technological upgrades, and the elimination of something that existed for many, many years called favoritism. These changes have increased predictability in our assessment system and spurred investment in both Chicago and Cook County. Fritz Kagey was born and raised in Chicago's Highs Park neighborhood. He still maintains close ties to the community. He attended Hyde Park's Kenwood Academy for high school, completed his undergraduate studies at Haverford College, located just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and received his MBA from Stanford University. Fritz's wife, Rebecca, is a teacher of Russian studies at the Pritzker Academy in Chicago. Fritz and his three children reside in Oak Park, Illinois, where Fritz is a member of the First United Methodist Church of Oak Park. I always like to point out whenever we have Assessor Kagey with us, that his father, Walter Kagey, a very distinguished retired professor emeritus of the University of Chicago Departments of History, was one of my teachers when I was a young graduate student, when my hair was a different color, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm always glad to hear how Professor Kagey is doing and also delighted that Fritz could join with us today and talk to us about the assessor's office in the city of Chicago. Fritz, you're on. All right, well, thanks, Ed, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, just to let you know, my dad is doing great down in Montgomery Place in Hyde Park and uh, will be watching with us today. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for starting us off. And before I begin my comments, uh, I wanted to take stock of where we all are today. Um, last weekend, I was at a memorial uh, for a friend and mentor. It was done virtually, of course, and and I reflected on everything that we've all been through. I mean, not even one year has elapsed from Illinois' first death from the virus. Um, in, in the country now, we have more than half a million dead from the virus. We have millions suffering from the lingering effects uh, and millions of survivors who could not be together to comfort each other in mourning. And us survivors were we're coping, but we're taking big hits too. Um, jobs lost and businesses shut. Life disrupted. Families that are living with complete exhaustion and ever-present risk. Um, we need to express gratitude for those all around us who are stepping in to stop the virus. All the people on the front lines, all the healthcare workers, they're all helping us to carry through. The county board, President Preckwinkle, Mayor Lightfoot and her team, so many others have delivered for us in this time of crisis and we should all thank them. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Ed, and everyone else at the City Club and all you members out there for sustaining this irreplaceable organization and asset to the city. I'm looking forward to when we're all 
back together in person at the clubhouse, Ed. Um, joining us today are many members of the assessor's office, and all of whom have performed admirably during a really incredibly difficult time. The work they did in 2019 made it possible for everything we did in early 2020, just before the virus hit. We launched online exemptions for the first time. We expanded the types of appeals you could do, do and file online. Uh, we created a whole new call center system. With the launch of our website, or of a whole new website, and the implementation of auto renewals of senior exemptions, we were able to handle the immense challenge of pivoting from in-person public service to remote public service, just as the full effects of COVID caused all of us to rethink how we work and live. And as citizens of this county, you should know that the staff of the office delivered under really extreme circumstances. They carried on through a deadly pandemic, coping with epic economic disruption that touched directly on our work, um, all while switching all of our systems midstream. And they kept the public and each other safe showing patience and flexibility, even as all of us felt pushed to our limits and even beyond. Um, this year, our staff implemented yet another way to make things easier uh, for, for vulnerable pop, uh, populations by processing exemption automatic renewals for low-income seniors, uh, persons with disabilities, and veterans with disabilities. And this was made possible through a bill passed by the General Assembly to make life a little easier for the hundreds of thousands of people most vulnerable to COVID. Um, as we face down this pandemic, I'm so proud of what we all accomplished together, um, and I'm grateful for the work that they do as dedicated public servants. Um, I want to let everyone today watching know that even we as accomplished as we accomplished all this, we were really frugal. Um, every day we try to show the public that we know the value of a dollar, and here's how we're making good use of our resources. In Cook County, we serve more property owners per full-time employee than any of the other large jurisdictions, which you can see here. And we do it by spending less per parcel than any of those places. And how do we do it? Not only with great effort, flexibility, and patience, but also the indispensable backing of Cook County Board President Preckwinkle, um, our county commissioners, and the Bureau of Technology that they oversee. They funded and supported our technological transformation in our efforts to reinforce our staff with training, new talent, and data. Um, each day we're in the trenches together modernizing the office for our county's betterment. Um, and so today, here's what we'll talk about. A study of commercial assessments by the gold standard in our field, the results of our suburban reassessments, the impact of COVID, the upcoming reassessment of Chicago, and closing the data gap that helps create some assessment disparities. But first, I want to talk about why it's so important to get this right and what it means for the average property owner's bottom line, because that underlies each of the topics that we'll be talking about today. Um, in our property tax system, assessments are interconnected. Each property owner needs to care about how everyone is assessed, not just their own assessment because otherwise that property owner may be picking up the tab for others through a higher tax rate. This is very important to understand because in Illinois, our property tax rates float. They're not fixed. Um, and the rate you pay depends on how big the base of assessed value is. The bigger the base, the lower the rate. So let me show you here what happens if part of the system is off kilter. Let's say we've done our job correctly and perfectly mirrored market values in our assessments. We have an example here. Commercial buildings, in our example here, uh, commercial buildings assess value is a million and homeowners value sum to a million. So the base is two million. And we're, we're doing our job, we've perfectly mirrored market values in our assessments. Folks who own property here have a school district, town, and other local services funded by property taxes. Um, incidentally, roughly two thirds of property taxes are for schools in most places in Cook County. So in our state, this thing called a levy is the amount of money that will be collected for these bodies, regardless of the size of the assessment base over on the left. And this is $400,000 in our example here. So what does this mean for a homeowner? Let's say she owns a bungalow with a $20,000 assessed value. 
she's then 1% of the base, $20,000 divided by 2 million. If she's 1% of the base, she has to pay 1% of that $400,000 levy. So her property tax bill is $4,000. But let's say the system, perhaps through inadequate data and valuation practices, undershoots market values by 50% and only assesses commercial at 50% of where the market is, while keeping residential values accurate. In that case, our base is now $1.5 million, with homeowners now representing two-thirds of the base. Now remember, the levy over on the right doesn't change. In our state, levies are lump sums of dollars that must be collected regardless of how the assessments are set. Assessments just determine how the levy is distributed after, after the tax rate is set. So the levy remains at 400000 So in this case, our homeowner is still assessed just as she was before at $20,000. She's still assessed accurately. But look at what happens to her tax bill on the right. It's gone up over $1,000 to 5320 Why? The reason why is her home is now a bigger piece of the base. She's picking up part of the tab for properties that are underassessed. This is why she has a stake in making sure the whole system is assessed fairly because everyone's assessment is interconnected. That's the key thing for all of us to remember because we're all dividing up the cost of government amongst ourselves based on these assessments. This is why our office is so focused on accuracy on eliminating assessment disparities because accuracy in assessments has huge implications for equity, always. In each of these areas that follow, the changes that we've made have focused on eliminating assessment inaccuracies and disparities that can make our system inequitable. These disparities are why I asked the International Association of Assessing Officers, which is the gold standard in our field, to examine the assessments in place as we found them and compare them to the prices paid in commercial property transactions in the county in 2018. They compared these, those commercial property sale prices with the system's estimated market values. These market values were determined by the prior administration and the Cook County Board of Review prior to our administration taking office. As I noted in the beginning, we need to consider residential and commercial assessments together. Now, the Civic Consulting Alliance found problems in residential assessments in Chicago in 2018. You've heard a lot about these, but they did find in aggregate residential values were on target. Homes were not on average over or under assessed, but the IWO found significant under assessment of most commercial properties. Overall, they found commercial properties were about 40% under assessed countywide on those transactions in 2018 and 50% underassessed in Chicago. The pattern was troubling in deeper ways too. Large commercial properties were assessed at lower rates than smaller businesses. And the values showed a lack of uniformity in many cases, creating the potential for more unfair tax disparities. Outlying neighborhood commercial properties also tended to be assessed at a higher rate. Uh, in short, some people were getting a break while others were making up the difference. As we saw in the earlier example, assessment disparities can mean that the annual financial impact of this underassessment can be really big for all those folks who are assessed accurately. This is why it was so important to focus on reducing distortions and eliminating these disparities as we reassess the suburbs over the last two years. The very first thing we did was commit ourselves to transparency by showing our work. No more black box valuations which were a source of endless complaints in the commercial community, some of which you can read about here. We also committed ourselves to eliminating sources of bias, favoritism, and conflicts of interest. This meant doing things like making commercial appeals anonymous to our analysts, implementing an ethics code forbidding campaign contributions from practitioners who practiced before us, and requiring evidence to be based on actual professional standards. For example, an appraisal actually had to meet the federal standards that a bank would require. For those of you who don't know, there's a small subset of the appraisal industry whose entire purpose is to argue that a double bacon cheeseburger is actually a salad. Um, and 
if, if, if it only worked like that, you know, all of us quarantined at home might be feeling a little bit slimmer uh, these days. But unprofessional practices by appraisal mills hurt equity if they're taken at face value because they can throw commercial assessments off kilter, injuring everyone else, not to mention bringing disrepute on honest appraisers who respect industry standards. Having high quality standards and using better data are really the key to making assessments more fair and more accurate. Now, I'm about to show you the results from the South Suburban Reassessment, but I can't help but plug our report on the North Suburban Reassessment. You should all check it out. It provides a lot of new data and graphics uh, where you can see how we took action to realign the system and also calculate for yourselves the impact of changes to assessments on properties in your community. This is a really good exercise that I know a lot of people have been doing. The report has great data and charts showing you our sources and the reasonable basis for the data that we use. If we could zoom in a little bit, people can see it. Um, and no one really disputes its accuracy or authoritativeness. These sources are what uh, you know people in the market use. Actually, we show sources that institutional investors can look up for themselves and track each day. Here's one example right here. You can see the chart in the center. And I got to say the report has some striking cover art contributed by world famous Chicago area artist Chris Ware with scenes and buildings from throughout the county. He's known for his illustrations being on the cover of The New Yorker, uh, but uh, Chicago's where his true love is and he lovingly portrays scenes from Chicago. So you should check that out too. So here are the results from our reassessment of the South suburbs. There's several things to note here. First of all, note that the base grew overall, uh, which you can see it grew 16%. The residential base grew, even after COVID adjustments, it grew. The commercial base grew more also after COVID adjustments. And with better modeling techniques, we dramatically improved regressivity in residential assessments. This is the tendency for higher value properties to be valued different from lower value properties. Um, and all these trends were a basic continuation of what we observed in the North suburbs, where we realigned the base with more accurate commercial assessments than the ones that we inherited. We'll soon have a report on the South suburbs, just like we did for the North, so check that out. As I mentioned, the assessments in the South suburbs took into account the devastating effects of COVID, and we are proud that they did. We were just starting to send out assessments in February, 2020, when the effects of COVID began to be seen here in Illinois. The individual sales transactions we prefer to use are reported with a lag of several months, but real estate capital markets told the story in real time. By the end of February, publicly traded portfolios of real estate were already taking big hits led by hotels and retail. By the end of March, serious distress was totally clear. Bond markets were showing distress with hotel and retail mortgages going on to watch this. Some commercial mortgage delinquency rates completely blew out from low single digits into the teens. The equity capital markets were seeing hotel values were down as much as 40%, with retail down 30%, single family homes down, while the market was also seeing that some kinds of real estate were up, like data centers. Um, then the governor and the president declared natural disasters, meaning that property owners could get relief for COVID impacts during the appeals process. Now, as you look at this chart, think back to the discussions that we opened up with today. Imagine having assessments reflecting a by now out of date state of the world. Some kinds of real estate devastated, others going up. But then add an additional element of distortion by imagining that only a portion of the assessments would be appealed. In that case, only some properties would reflect the market impacts of COVID but the majority of assessments would likely be frozen in place with pre-COVID assessments. If we did nothing and stood pat, we would not only not reflect current market conditions, but we'd also create a notably more inequitable assessment role with some carrying the burden for others. The more equitable thing to do is to recalculate assessments with these effects included. It wouldn't be perfect because no matter when we made our valuation decision, conditions would continue to change afterwards, and they did. Um, but at least the overall assessment role would have the initial effects of COVID reflected, saving some property owners some of the costs and troubles of appealing during a pandemic while creating a more 
equitable and up-to-date assessment role. We published our first valuation document last May, noting all of the data sources and methods used in our residential assessments, then a follow-up on our commercial assessments. You can find those reports along with uh, community-specific maps of our residential assessments on our website. Now, 2021 is one of our biggest challenges yet, more challenging even in some ways than 2020. First, we're reassessing the city of Chicago, which represents 52% of the parcels in Cook County. We're also doing more than half of our triennial, so in other words, we're doing more than half of our triennial uh, reassessment work this year. We're confident we'll meet this challenge as we've improved the quality of our residential modeling and are regularly uh, meeting the IWO standards for high quality assessments. We're also launching the opening phase of replacing our office's whole software and hardware system of record. This is the beginning of our county's deployment of the integrated property tax system from Tyler Technologies. It is a long delayed upgrade that moves us away from the aging mainframe platform used to power four offices involved in Cook County's property tax system. And this upgrade will get us off the kind of uh, green screen technology used in the movie War Games and onto a modern platform used by assessors offices nationwide. It'll also mean the data and methodology um, will be more transparent and easier to access than ever. We expect the trends that we observed in the suburbs to continue in Chicago. That is, we expect the residential and commercial base to grow, to close the disparity gaps observed in commercial reassessments, and to reduce the regressivity of residential assessments. All of these things will address the disparities and inequity identified by the IAAO. With the world turned upside down by COVID, we're also trying to make sure we have an accurate picture of local conditions facing commercial properties, especially ones in the neighborhoods. We're meeting with commercial property owners, chambers of commerce, and others. We're seeking to independently verify neighborhood commercial data, and we're encouraging folks to use our real property income and expense tool uh, known as RPI. Uh, every commercial parcel owner in Chicago this year received RPI instructions in the mail. This tool helps us close the data gap that may have contributed to the disparities where smaller commercial properties tended to be assessed more highly than larger ones especially in neighborhoods where third-party data is really scarce. It lets owners tell us what real on-the-ground conditions are like. Now, you would think a tool that gets assessments right at the beginning of the process would be welcome uh, by most people. It saves property owners money on the appeals process and certainly gets their assessment at a more accurate initial position. Uh, but it seems not everyone shares our enthusiasm for better data. We've seen more than a few letters and statements like this one from uh, property tax firms who instructed their clients not to fill it out. Check it out here. Why would these groups be opposed to our efforts to get better data? Why wouldn't they want us to create fairer assessments from the beginning instead of forcing taxpayers to go through a costly and time-consuming appeals process? Well, yes, there will always be a need for appeals to correct errors, but to force property owners into a broken system that's dependent on appeals, it keeps us buried in the corruptive influences of the past. And that just seems kind of um, hinky to use a word known around the uh, city club in Chicago. Um, so RPI is the best tool that we have at our own disposal for the data gaps that create assessment disparities. But what's the best way to close the data gaps that create these disparities? It's to adopt the methods that our peers in other major cities use. They have a common sense requirement for larger rent earning commercial properties to send basic data about rent expenses and vacancy to assessors offices at the beginning of the assessment process so that these kinds of properties can be valued more accurately. And it's data people have to submit to us on, anonymized, on a non-anonymized basis when they appeal. Um, the data modernization bill, House Bill 860, would require this on an anonymized basis in Cook County and in other Illinois counties, they could opt in. It's a framework in place in healthy real estate markets around the U.S. in places like Boston, Virginia, uh, Seattle, and D.C. Put simply, it works. 
It's more important than ever because COVID's impacts are gonna be felt for years. Think of downtown office and neighborhood retail where sublease vacancy and, and concession rates could be quite different going forward. We need to be able to observe data that shows us real changes in volatility in the market conditions, neighborhood by neighborhood. Changes our data from third-party vendors might miss. You'll remember the data modernization bill already passed the Senate by a bipartisan supermajority. In the new session, we're hopeful on very many fronts. Since then, we have a new Senate president in Don Harmon and a new House speaker in Chris Welch. The public is demanding property tax reform, while the new General Assembly also sees the need for the structural change. As we work towards passage of the data modernization bill, we're looking forward to working with our sponsors, Senator Christina Castro and Representative Will Davis. They have a demonstrated commitment to property tax reform in their careers. They are advocates for education and they have records of acting on behalf of equity. Most importantly, they understand how each of these issues are interconnected. And that's how I'd like to close our discussion today. Senator Castro and Representative Davis are familiar with the disparities in the chart that I'm about to show you. And I'd like to let it sink in here. Um, look at this. I have scoured the nation for parallels uh, to the rate disparities in Cook County, where we have some communities paying rates three times to five times the size of other communities. I have not found them. And this rate disparity is really exceptional. And the communities paying the highest rates have populations with demographics that are either majority black or Latino. You can see that in the bottom of the chart here. I wish I could say that the shocking racial disparity here is a surprise, but it's not. But that doesn't make it any less of an outrage. Um, you know, these charts show that housing equity is actually a bigger portion of wealth that, you know, what I meant to say is that black and Latino communities have more of their wealth invested in their home than other uh, communities do. Um, and these charts show that in these communities, the tax cost of ownership is multiples of what it, what it is for others. This excess eats away at equity. It caps the potential for growth and for compound growth. It blunts efforts to stimulate home ownership through lowering finance costs because for so many of our neighbors, and many people have told me about this, it means taxes exceed the costs of the mortgage. If you want to identify something that destroys intergenerational wealth and is a textbook example of structural racism, this is it. I was elected to change the assessment piece of our property tax system, and we are making progress. My team has been working hard to fully reflect all value in the tax base, so tax burdens are fair for all. But in some communities, the burden of paying for schools and other services still falls far too heavily on Black and Latino homeowners, regardless of the fairness of the assessment. Even if the assessments were done perfectly, that would be the case. When we wonder why our area is losing population, when we see the inflow of new residents doesn't make up for this decline, it's because we're continuing to depend on an economic system that is dependent on brick and mortar for revenue and has not yet met the demands of the 21st century. Funding our schools is tethered to the value of brick and mortar in the community at a time when our economy needs less and less brick and mortar. I'm proud of the changes I've seen in this office. A new website, easier access to data, getting off a mainframe computer is great, but it's not enough to solve the disparities in the system. I am gonna to continue to speak out about how data gaps lead to assessment disparities. I'll continue to highlight the need for more state funding for education, and I'll remain a strong advocate for more federal Title I funding for our schools, as I did in the Chicago Tribune op-ed last year. It's the most equitable way to reduce property tax levies for school districts, which represent 60 to 70% of most Cook County tax bills. I understand that the problems of the property tax system seem too big, and it might be easier if we just focus on one part of it at a time, 
But as we've seen over the last year, life doesn't work that way. Um, complicated systemic problems don't get easier if you just ignore them. They just get worse. Um, as elected officials, we're put here to take on the big jobs. Overdependence on property taxes will continue to hurt those who already bear too great a burden. By the way, I know so many people are, care about property taxes, and I think we should really focus, we're focused on the burden of property taxes. We should focus on this funding issue for schools rather than trying to shift the burden from, from one group um, to another. But, but you know, the, in the last few years, I've delivered on many of the promises that I made to reform our office, but the larger system still needs to change to become more ethical, more fair, and more transparent. I'll continue to wage that fight and work with others to solve the big financial problems and other big problems that lie ahead. So thank you to the City Club for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, and I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you, for Assessor Kagi. And now we have time for some questions and answers, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I also want to bring to your attention some upcoming events that the City Club is proud to present to our viewing audiences. Number one, March 16th, the new Speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives Christopher Welch of Hillside, Illinois, will address the City Club through the Zoom meeting process March 16th, but it'll be at noon, 12 p.m., instead of our traditional 1 p.m., so that we can fit into the busy schedule that Speaker Welch has on his plate. Then on the 23rd of March, the Chancellor of the Outstanding public tax-supported institution in the city of Chicago. Mike Amaritas of the University of Illinois at Chicago will speak to us at 11 a.m. So that's March 23rd, Chancellor Amaritas of UIC, and the 16th of March, Speaker Chris Welch of the Illinois House of Representatives. And here is something that is really special. It takes place on the 4th of March, two days from today. The City Club is co-sponsoring a series on black mayors and leadership in the United States. This is a program presented by the University of California at Berkeley in conjunction with the Great Cities Institute at UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago. Two o'clock on Thursday, our own Mayor Lori Lightfoot but will speak on criminal justice reform. There will be more info on this program that will appear in your inboxes later today so that if your schedule allows, this should be very interesting, Thursday, March 4th at 2 p.m. Well, Chancellor Kagey, I mean, Assessor Kagey, I just gave you a academic promotion. <laughs> um, based on what you've said, there really is a new day for the citizens of Cook County in terms of assessments and understanding assessments, adopting best practices. You mentioned a number of reports issued by your office. I assume that these are on your website. Yes, uh, we've put uh, all these reports on our website. Um, so the IAAO report uh, is available there. Uh, all of the uh, COVID adjustment reports, all of our neighborhood reports. Uh, we just had a market analyst day with Mayor Lightfoot uh, and her a terrific CFO, Jenny Huang Bennett, uh, that helps investors. We put other tools up there. So uh, if you haven't been to our website in the last couple of years, check it out. It's completely revamped. We've got a lot of great data there. We're very proud of it. Okay, and we're getting a number of uh, good questions coming in. And uh, based on it, one of your comments about um, law firms that have advised their clients uh, not to cooperate with that RPI chart, mm -hmm. I would bet that you would not be named man of the year by some of those law firms. 
That's right. But we don't work for the law firms. We work for Absolutely. the property owners and the people who live here. Uh, okay. You know, for, 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 for uh, you know, I think that to, to even center that around the conversation is, is kind of the premise uh, kind of shows how we've been coming from uh, not a great place. That you know, our job is to get the numbers right at the outset as best we can. And this is something that our peers do as a matter of course. As I've mentioned my speeches here before, um, you know, in our peers and the rest of the country, um, they get they get this right mostly at the outset. Appeals rates are small. They're not necessary. Everyone has appeals rights, but they're they're not as necessary. And we need to there should be a basic expectation that a property owner has that we will be uh, doing a good job with the data that's out there, that we have enough good data to get it right. And if they think our data is wrong, for goodness sakes, get it to us before you start paying fees and going through the troubles of hiring people to try to fix it. Like we should listen to you if you're telling us that my rents or my square footage or my condition or the quality of my building is is in so-and-so a position. And that's what the RPI gives someone a chance to do so that you don't have to take the time and trouble and money uh, to fix that through appeals. Why not get it to us before you start? Because if you appeal, you're going to have to fill it out anyway. Thank you. Okay, here's our first question from one of our viewers. This is from <clears throat> Jane Romweber Santo Grossi. Hope I pronounced your name correctly, Jane. My condo association automatically appeals assessments every year through a law firm that takes her words, a cut of the savings. Jane wants to know, is this part of a corrupt system that we should all try to eliminate? Well, what I would say is it's pretty inefficient if your condo building, to get the number right, has to appeal and pay money that is your money to get it right in the first place. Uh, we should be getting good data about uh, condo buildings and making sure that we're assessing it right at the outset. And if you think you've been not been treated fairly and the assessment for your condo is not an accurate reflection of market price of your condo and other units in your building, then you should uh, appeal. But like, it should not be part of the model of our office that you have to automatically do this. And I understand why these behaviors evolve. You know, Ed, you mentioned my dad when we started this and many people who've grown up in Chicago and the suburbs, you have this moment in your life where someone who loves you comes to you and says, let me break it down for you how it works in Cook County. They're gonna send you a number that makes no sense. And if you don't hire someone to get it fixed and you don't appeal and you don't pay these guys and they fix it by some process that I don't understand, you're a sucker. Um, and that's kind of the be behavior that's been learned for quite a long time uh, in Cook County because the numbers weren't coming out right. There was an ecosystem where that was the best thing to do. We are trying to fix that. The first thing is to have good technology, good modeling, eliminate the conflicts of interest, show your work, um, and eventually um, you'll get these numbers right. But I, you know, you shouldn't feel like you automatically have to appeal when you live in a condo building. Uh, there are some unique circumstances with that. We only assess the whole building, and then the value of the building is divided up by the unit holders based on their articles of association that determine their percentage ownership of the building. So you guys are kind of lashed together um, in that prospect. So it's not necessarily hinky for you know the condo association to hire someone to try to get uh, the best assessment you can. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're getting that right the first time, that it's consistent with others, then the system's more equitable for everyone. I, I've talked to condo owners um, in the north suburbs who've seen the valuations that we came out with, um, and they, they're they seeing that they're a lot more uniform than they used to be. Um, and, you know, uh, people are see, seeing that our numbers are, are pretty sound. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is from someone I'm sure you're familiar with his name, Robert Wislow. And uh, Bob wants to know, how are you treating vacancies in commercial properties? There are so many more vacant commercial properties, particularly since uh, the onset of the pandemic um, and so forth. So how is your office addressing that? Vacancy is extremely serious. It's obviously a, a very important 
part of the market that affects the economics of a building, what someone would pay for it. Um, the, what we have done um, is make, make sure that uh, we're incorporating vacancy into the valuation of every building. We don't want to assess a building assuming it's 100% occupied. We want to put ourselves into the shoes of a, of a buyer. Um, and, as, and if I was a buyer, I would assume there's a, a normal level of background vacancy that would apply to the building that I bought. And so that's what we do. So we've made sure, first of all, that every commercial property that we're assessing doesn't assume it's 100% occupied, but assumes a market level of vacancy. If a building has more vacancy than that, um, it depends on the circumstances that cause it. Then what we do is we will look at what would a reasonable buyer pay for uh, this building which has so much vacancy. There are lots of things that can create vacancy. It might be a new building that's still ramping up. It might be a building that had some kind of catastrophe happen. It might be in the middle of a giant renovation. Um, there might have, it might have lost a, a huge amount of tenants. Um, we want to know what the, um, uh, you know, if vacancy is greater than the market level of vacancy, we will incorporate that into our evaluation, but it's not necessarily going to be at a one-for-one -one level. If a building is 50% vacant and the background vacancy is 25%, we will give the building a fraction of the credit for that additional amount of vacancy, but it will only be done temporarily because we assume a builder will eventually be able to get it occupied. But the key to all of this succeeding is making sure that we have a good sense for what neighborhood vacancy is for that kind of property. And we know this changes rapidly. Like downtown office properties, we know there is going to be a significant amount of sublease activity. Uh, we know um, there are other, there's new supply coming online. This is really why the data modernization bill is so important uh, because it can give us a sense of how these circumstances are changing and we can take into account. Um, if, and it might not just be through the simple vacancy itself. And by the way, our vacancy policy is also published on our website. We published it last summer, you can see it. Um, but you know, there's some things when there's vacancy that creates other things that affect the economics of the building. As Bob Whistlow knows, maybe you know a building isn't feeling the vacancy that its peers are, but maybe they have to give lots of other concessions to get the building occupied. Maybe they have to give lots of months of free rent. Maybe they have to give concessions like free uh, fit out and, and other kinds of concessions. Those are subtractions to the value, the earning power of the building. We want to know about them. The RPI is our best effort that we can do on our own to try to gather that information. So people should tell us that. People who own buildings that are facing these pressures should tell us about them, fill out the form uh, and, and tell us that uh, as we reassess Chicago this year. And then the data modernization bill helps this, you know, will give us that awareness across uh, Cook of when people are enrolled. Thank you very much, Assessor, thank you. Uh, this uh, question is from Kathleen Jones. Um, she's a surviving spouse of a deceased veteran whose cause of death was 100% a service-connected disability. Kathleen Jones is entitled to a tax exemption. Her question, do I need to continue submitting a letter from the VA verifying the same? Um, I, uh, what I'd like, what I'd refer you to is, our, is the exemption section of our website where you can get all of the information on the forms that you need to submit. Um, veterans with, uh, you know, there are some exemptions this year that automatically renew because of COVID, the veterans with disabilities, uh, for example. Um, we are seeking other legislation that would automatically renew other parts of the veterans um, ex uh, exemption. But you should, I, what I'd like you to do is go to our website, go to the exemption section, and, and go to the part where um, it has the veterans exemptions. So it has the list of of documents that that you'll need to file. Most of these can be done electronically um, now through uh, the DocuSign that we've we put online. But there are some things where you will have to file file paperwork. Thank you very much. Um, this question is from Joseph Darguzis, who's with Joko. His question is: Why don't your response to appeals 
have more than generic, quote, we have reviewed and it's consistent, end quote. Why don't you provide online access to analysts' analysis? Maybe the appeal should be denied, but it's very, very frustrating not to know why. Um, well, we are upgrading. First of all, we're, you know, our systems have to be upgraded to get us to the point where we could give you a greater sense. If we want, even if we wanted to, to give you analyst notes before, uh, we couldn't. Now, with the implementation of the Tyler system, it allows us to do a lot more. We're putting more standard operation, standard operating procedures into place for our residential analysts and other analysts who follow appeals this year uh, so that we ensure uniformity amongst what the analysts are doing when they make decisions. Um, but one of the things you should know is we created a data science department um, that runs a model. All of its code is published online for people to see. And we explain in plain English some of the basic uh, you know, workings of how the model um, uh, is done. And what, what that model is doing, it is already checked for uniformity inconsistencies that might have existed under the way the assessor's office did before, but the model pre-checks for that. So some of the, the things that might have led to a successful appeal before are not as successful now because the model is trying to anticipate them and, and do that work in advance. Um, but when, when you make an appeal based on building characteristics, like we'll tell you that, like that is an important thing to know. Um, uh, uh, but you know, we will, with our new systems, there will be more um, that we can show you. Remember that we have, um, you know, in the city of Chicago, we, we will have uh, hundreds of thousands of of appeals um, that that will give, and sometimes the the reasons why the appeals are done are pretty consistent. There might you know one reason might apply to hundreds of thousands of different appeals, and if the language seems standard, it's just because that's that's something that can be common, quite common. Good. Thank you very much, Assessor Kagi. Um, this is from a member of our City Club Board of Governors, so I better ask this question: mm -hmm. Francis Cow. Francis says, assessment transparency is extremely important. Will your office provide an online tool that needs simple inputs, ask some questions about exemptions, and produces a non-binding simulated assessment and projected tax? The current tool, she feels, is buried in the website. Feels like there are too many barriers to accessing the information? Um, so we are, we have a tool that is uh, basically ready, um, but is being held up because of um, the, the data switchover that's happening now in the backbone of our system of records. So we've created a, a tool called Inval, which will allow you to look at what are the biggest factors driving your assessment how are homes like yours in your neighborhood uh, and on your street uh, valued? Um, PINVAL draws from uh, different data sources that are now being switched over into this new Tyler system of record. So we have to have the new Tyler system of record ready to go before we can put PINVAL out there. But we've our, our developers and our data science unit have worked really hard on creating this. And I think that will get you to what's there. We do have this tool um, the uh, rate simulation tool, which is very valuable for commercial property owners. We know uh, that people are using it. Um, we, we like to think it's not buried. That's really good feedback. We can put it in a more uh, prominent link, but uh, we, we did have a market analyst day just a couple of weeks ago where hundreds of uh, market participants came and they could go in and uh, put in their assumptions about the base, all the different things that drive the base. They could create their own scenarios about levies in the city. A lot of people wanted to see what the impact of uh, the city's new budget would be on property tax bills for different kinds of properties. That tool is there for everyone to use. It's the rate simulation tool. If you just search that on Google it's, it, in Cook County, it should pop uh, right up. And we have documentation on how to use it. It is, unfortunately, complex because our property tax system is very complex. For example, in Chicago, 
just calculating the change in base is hard. Even if I told you all the different variables that might change for office and uh, apartments and residential and all that, it would still be complicated by the fact that there are lots of TIFFs where some of that value might grow with, with inside of a TIFF and not be part of the base. So some of this is just very complicated because of the patchwork of our property tax system. I wish it was simpler, um, but you know we got to own up to the fact that it's sometimes complex. But that tool that we gave, the rate simulation tool, um, is the best thing that we can do now um, for a for a homeowner who's looking at a home. Um, you know the most important thing to do is look at these. Uh, community reports that we publish to see what is the size of the base in your community um, so that then when you're seeing how you're if you figure your property is going to be estimated according to market value and the base stays as it is then you can get pretty close to where um, your bill is and the tool helps you um, with that but there there are moving targets here remember that our assessments uh, can be modified by the board of review that can shrink the base um, levies can go up uh, because of decisions made by school boards um, and things can get complicated by things like tips. Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you, Assessor Kagi. Um, this is from a resident of Madison on the south suburbs, LaShawn James. First of all, he says, great presentation. Gives us hope to saving our homes. We have been carrying the load by paying enormous property taxes for years. We have appealed each year, no relief. What can our village do to assist moving schools off of property taxes? We need help. Well, I'm, I'm really, uh, I really like the way the question uh, ended there because the property, if you, if you live in Matheson, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, you pay a high rate, which is, even if our assessments were perfect and everyone could agree on them, the rate would still be high because Matheson was one of many communities where residential values were really hit in the crisis of ten, the global financial crisis of 10 years ago. Values fell a lot. That shrank the base by 50%. A lot of the residential stores that Matheson has relied on have been hurt by the growth of Amazon. For a, for a one dollar's worth of sales, Amazon needs half of the amount of brick and mortar that even a really efficient operator like Walmart or Target might need. So that's putting pressure on all of the brick and mortar retailers and further creating pressure to shrink the base. You have a great mayor and you have a really active community development effort that they're one of the things they're trying to do is grow the base. They want to add commercial activity so that that can make the base be bigger. And the, when they do that, when they have more things open, that helps generate sales taxes, which can say, take some of the pressure off of property taxes for your village. But the big kahuna is how do we fund schools? You asked that in the question, and, and that is great. Because for all of us here on this call, on this uh, uh, speech today, I know many people are concerned about the level of property taxes in Cook County. The key thing to understand is that oftentimes it's not about assessments. If you just change assessments, you are changing the mix. And maybe assessments were not done properly before, um, and so you were not getting a fair deal. So we are trying to fix that. But the bigger problem is if we get all of our assessments fixed perfectly, the rates may be high in a lot of parts of Cook County still. And that is because. In our state, um, our communities, our school districts have to take on more of the cost of paying for their schools through taxing brick and mortar than any other part of the United States. Um, and so that is why property taxes are, are high in our state. And how do we do this? First of all, we work with our legislators to make sure that the state is carrying more of the cost of educating our kids so it doesn't fall so heavily on property taxes. That's the first thing that can be done. Um, and we have many legislators who are committed to that. Will Davis, uh, co-sponsor of the data modernization bill, is one of the really heroes on this. He's helped to shift the uh, education funding formula um, and so that we can start getting things going in the right direction on that. The other thing that needs to be done is that the federal government can help school funding too. 
um, uh, President Biden committed to tripling funding for something called Title I, which is federal support for disadvantaged students uh, in K through 12 schools throughout the country. And that can make a really big difference. If they triple Title I, which is only an additional expense of $30, million, $30 billion for the government, which is kind of a rounding error given all the big numbers thrown around in Washington, Washington in these days, that would reduce the levies if some of that value was passed on to taxpayers by a significant amount. So, and I think folks in the South suburbs who live in communities like Matteson, we should be raising our voices because the South suburbs really do pay the highest tax rates in the nation and you get less help than any other place in the nation to help support the funding of your schools. The South Suburbs really is a, a case that the whole country should know about, about why the federal government needs to be doing more to help to support uh, the funding of schools. And the last thing I'd, I'd say here is that this is gonna be more urgent with COVID and the development of our economy. Here's why. Our economy needs less and less brick and mortar to work. Uh, think about Amazon on the retail side. Think about the fact that we're all doing this on Zoom. We might not need as much office space to make the economy go as before. And if you take that one step further, there may be people who are on this call who are coming in from Michigan or out of state right now, but who do still do work in Chicago. So they might not need to be living having brick and mortar homes in the Chicago area like they used to. Um, and you know, who knows? There may be more and more people who are completely working from abroad who are not even Americans who are doing some of this work. So because we have less and less brick and mortar need to make our economy go, we cannot keep tethering education funding to taxing brick and mortar. We are one of the only countries that does this. Um, it is not healthy for us when the economy is changing so much. It can only increase segregation um, and disparities. And so the best way to, to get in front of that is to act on Title I so we have more federal government support for schools because the federal government's really in the best position to tax this virtual activity and in incomes. Our states and localities are not really well set up to do that. Dr. Kagi, I just have time. We just have time for two questions. We'll try to keep your yep. uh, responses brief. Uh, this is from Bob Eider with the Park 540 Community Garden Group. In your opinion, what's the likelihood of our state legislature enacting property tax reform in 2021? I think I'm hopeful on this because um, I know from talking to members of the General Assembly that this is seen as one of the areas of unfinished business where people are, are unhappy. I know there are some people who voted down the fair tax amendment uh, because they, not because they opposed it in principle, but they thought, you know, I have some preconditions that I want to see before I'll support something like that. I want to see ethics reform. I want to see property tax reform. And property tax reform is the number one thing uh, that comes up. Um, and the great thing about our data modernization bill, which is, a really important part of property tax reform is, is from the state point of view, this does not involve some of the terrible trade-offs or high fiscal costs that other property tax reform measures might involve. This is about getting us good data, adopting a thing that works in other states, and it builds confidence that it's going to be good for, for homeowners and for small business because it causes those data disparities that we talked about so much in the presentation. So I think I'm very... I am I'm very hopeful um, that, you know, our leaders, you know, our, um, both uh, Don Harmon and um, Chris Welch were sponsors of the data modernization bill. Um, and I'm, I, I know that the legislators are, are really focused on this because the people are focused on it. The uh, question that you responded to about uh, property taxes and uh, the legislature is a good question to keep in mind for uh, Speaker Chris Welch when he joins with us on the 16th of March. One last question before we wrap things up. Sure. And since you're a former Hyde Parker, but whose heart still is in that area, by the way, the assessor told me he's a White Sox fan. So that's very important because so am I. Uh, the question is from Vincent Cole with the Woodlawn Chamber of Commerce. He wants to know, 
How will upcoming neighborhood investment projects, for example, the impending Obama Presidential Center, affect property assessment valuation for current residents and existing businesses? Any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so remember, we're all interconnected. So first, let's talk about what is happening with the market in Woodlawn. Our job here is to mirror the market. Um, and follow what the market is doing, uh, because that's our job, not only for you, but for everyone to make sure that we're mirroring the market. Uh, in Woodlawn, we've seen house values go up a lot um, because of the development of the uh, Obama Museum and other developments. Woodlawn is a great place. Um, it has lots of uh, things going on uh, in neighborhoods around it, like South Shore and Hyde Park are growing too. and so. What we've seen in the data is that the market uh, prices are moving up there. Um, and so that those will be reflected in our um, assessments. The good news for folks in, in Woodlawn is that we think the base is growing throughout Chicago um, and we're gonna be addressing these assessment disparities that have led part of the system to be um, under assessed before that folks in Woodlawn uh, will benefit from. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I'd note is that RPI, for, for business owners who are members of the Woodlawn Chamber, um, you know, Woodlawn has, the data that we will have from our third party vendors is not going to be very good. It's not going to tell us enough about what's going on, for example, at Daly's Restaurant, you know, at 63rd uh, in Cottage under the tracks. It's not going to give us a sense of what's happening to all those spaces on Cottage as you go south uh, from 63rd Street. So this is why all the commercial property owners who received an RPI form should fill it out and tell us you know, what they're seeing, what their rents are like, what their occupancies are like, if, if they're having trouble uh, collecting rent from their tenants, because that will give us a much better picture of the real world conditions going on uh, in Woodlawn um, than um, the third party data that we might start with, where the third party data really probably reflects more about what's going on in more developed neighborhoods in the rest of the city that have a lot more chain stores and spaces that are more modern. Um, so I think for, a, you know, we, we want to speak to your members of the Woodlawn Chamber and others about you to encourage folks to participate and to help them understand and, and guide them through that. Very good. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank not only our assessor for taking time to be with us this morning, but all of Team Kagi. You have assembled a great group of women and men and are, are doing just a very interesting, unusual, and frequently not appreciated job because many of us did not know that this morning would be like being in a graduate seminar <laughs> in assessments. So we thank you for that. Well, um, we wanted to explore the space a little bit uh, and, and use the, the presentation since everyone's at home. Uh, and we thought we'd give that a shot. I'm really proud of my team. They thank you for the show. Tremendous. Uh, Assessor, once again, we want to present you with our famous City Club mug. We love transparency, Ed. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And you can't mug. be any more transparent than this. <laughs> and of course, a one year membership in the City Club of Chicago. And I think this is your third or fourth appearance, and we look forward to having you back with us in the not-so-distant future. Folks, we are a 501c3 organization, and we're dependent on your support. If any of you would like to contribute, and we hope many of you will, to the City Club of Chicago, just go to our website and contact us, send us your check, and we will see that it is put to the best use for the premier discussion group on metropolitan affairs, not only in the city of Chicago, but throughout the entire United States. So once again, look in your inbox later today for that invitation to hear Mayor Lightfoot at 2 p.m. tomorrow, March 16th, Speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives, Chris Welch, and March 23rd, Chancellor Michael Emeritus of the University of Illinois at Chicago. On behalf of the City Club of Chicago, I'm Ed Mazur, Chairman of the City Club, 
We bid you a good day. Thank you.